Okay, if you want to open your Bibles to 1 Samuel 16, we're back in 1 Samuel again. We left it the last time where God's righteous judgment upon the Amalekites had been undertaken by Saul and the children of Israel. And of course we learned that Saul had not complied with what God had asked him to do. And that we were left with sheep and oxen and King Agag who had escaped Saul's punishment. <clears throat> and it was really a matter of the fact that Saul had this deep-rooted, I don't know how to describe it, but a deep-rooted pride that was within him, that he thought he was better than God. On many occasions as we work through the book of Samuel here, First Samuel, we've seen that Saul has repeatedly stood against what God would have him do. He has tried to be spiritual in his own strength and it has failed miserably. Rather than submitting and humbling himself under God's mighty hand, he has decided to, to do his own thing. And here at the end of chapter 15, we see the same sort of thing that Samuel comes to him and said, why did you not do what the Lord asked you to do? He says, I did do it. He says, well, I'm, why am I hearing sheep bleating and cows blowing? And who's this guy, Agag, that you've rescued? Well, you know, uh, I'm sure that God would love us to, to have all these animals and sacrifice them to him and all the rest of it. But really, the men that took the animals captive were only following Saul's example. When he saw him sparing some of the Amalekites, then they thought, well, as is the normal practice, we'll just get tore in here and we'll take the livestock, the money off the belts of the dead people and we'll just make it a normal battle. But this wasn't a normal battle. This was a righteous judgment of God upon the Amalekites. And if you want to know why, then you can get the last study. But Saul then sort of tried to wheedle his way back into the situation by saying to Samuel, well, you know, Samuel, I know I've sinned, but you know what? If you would just accompany me so that we can go and worship the Lord, it would be it would be great. You know, the guys would be quite pleased to see you with me. And, and, and Samuel said, well, I'm not doing it, Saul. It's a pointless exercise. You know, it's useless worship because you're going there with the wrong motives. Your heart is all wrong. So, so why should I bother? But, but Samuel, just, just do it. Just, just for me. And, and that, in, in some measure, just sums up Saul's heart. Just for me. Just do it for me so that I don't lose face. So Saul acceded to do it, but he, he did it on the basis that it was a pointless exercise. It just would not achieve anything. And as he turned away from Saul, you know, he said to Saul, he says, you know, God has he's regretted ever making you king over Israel. And as, Saul, as Samuel turned away from him, it would appear just for the whole sort of, what would you say, that the, the ergonomics of the thing, that Saul must have been on his knees with Samuel at this point in time, because he grabbed the hem of his cloak and he said, Samuel, you know, Samuel, help me. You know, I need to get myself back right with the Lord. And he tore Samuel's robe. And that, in some measure, was a... I mean, for a priestly garment to be torn was a, a no-no. I mean, we remember that with, with Jesus, with Caiaphas, when Jesus was accused of speaking blasphemy, and Caiaphas stuck his fingers in his ears and tore his robe. And the priests were not allowed to tear their robes. They were not allowed to show their emotions in that sense. And we see the same thing happening with Jesus at the cross. The, the robe that they took off him, the priestly robe, the high priest's robe, when they gambled for it, they said, oh, this is made in one, one piece, so we'll, we'll throw dice for it, because the robe would not be torn. And so this was a big thing for the, ro the robe of the priest to be torn, especially with the sort of almost anger that Saul did it with. And Samuel turned to him and said, Today, the God, over Israel, the God of Israel has torn the robe, has torn the kingdom from your hand as you tore the, the, the bottom of my robe. And he put it this way, and it's one of these things that I always hang on to, that, that you know, he says here, He who is the glory of Israel does not lie or change his mind, for he is not a man that he should change his mind. God never changes his mind. God always knows what's happening. It may seem that there's contradictions here and there, but you know, God before the foundation of the world knew exactly where Saul would be. 
But Saul had to make some responsible decisions and he wasn't prepared to do that. He was like an iceberg. There was a little bit of spirituality sticking up, but there was a whole load of nonsense underneath it. And so we're in that situation where Saul is put down, he's, he's, he's literally on his knees there with this piece of robe in his hand and Samuel has walked away and, and said to him, by the way, where's Agag? So they bring Agag out and Agag, it says there in 15, chapter 15 at the end of verse 32, Agag came to him confidently thinking, surely the bitterness of death has passed. So this guy thought, well, they've not killed me so far, so I'll, I'll go on with it. But Samuel took the sword and said, as your sword has killed many in the Israelite camp, so I'm going to deal with you today, the Lord God of Israel. And he slaughtered them. And, you know, it says that they put him to death with the sword. But the whole sense of the thing, if you actually read the words in there, he hacked him to death, he hacked him to pieces. Such is what happens to sin. Sin has to be hacked to pieces. And it was, a, it was a, a, a warning to Israel that this is what happens when you disobey God, that the Lord has to step in and there has to be a real judgment upon this. So Agag was hacked to pieces. And Samuel left for Ramah at the end of chapter 15. Now Ramah, you'll find out later in this book, but Ramah was the place where he had set up, where Samuel had set up a school for the prophets. And so he returned to what God had asked him to do, to teach, to, to encourage, to raise up young men in, in the ministry that they could succeed Samuel as the prophets of Israel once he had gone to glory. So he returned to what he was going to do. And it, and it was quite, it's quite pathetic there in the sense that until the day Samuel died, he did not see Saul again, though Samuel mourned for him. And the Lord was grieved that he'd made Saul king over Israel. And so, that was the end of Saul. But you see, but Saul was still there for a long time. Yes, he was. But that was the word that the Lord had put down. It's a finished Saul. You can either give up just now, or you can keep trying to hold on to something that's not yours. But it'll be a hard task. And so at the start of chapter 16, the Lord said to Samuel... <clears throat> Excuse me. How long will you mourn for Saul since I have rejected him as king over Israel? There's a sense here that, that Samuel had really gone into a kind of deep mourning for Saul. Now, it, it always surprises me because his sons never inherited the priesthood. In fact, they, they, they were specifically banned from being part of the priesthood, Samuel's sons. And he, we're not told that he particularly mourned for that, but he mourned for this. And it became, because of what the scripture says here, it became an unhealthy mourning. It became something that was putting his life on hold because his whole life was occupied with mourning for Saul. Maybe it was because he was the one who had anointed Saul and he was the one who had stood in the gap between the Lord and the children of Israel. But God says to him, why do you mourn so long for Saul? And it's something that we have to remember as well. It can, be a, it can be a loss. It can be a broken relationship. It can be a, a dispute between friends. But if you leave it too long, it becomes unhealthy. If you concentrate on it too long, it becomes unhealthy. You become overwhelmed by it. You, you, you're chained to it. You, you just don't have that ability to move on. I, I can't do it because of my relationship break up with my mother or my father or my sister or my brother. I can't do it because this friend of mine has, has hurt me and, 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 I'm, and really at the end of the day what you are is mourning for that. You're mourning for something that was lost to you, not just a dead person, but maybe, a, as I say, a relationship or whatever. So there's a time for mourning and there's a time for setting aside mourning. And at this point in time, God says to Samuel, I've got other work for you to do. Set this aside. Forget about Saul. Saul's dealt with. I am not a God who changes my mind. Saul is dealt with. Although it would be 25 years from this point before David would actually take the crown of Israel, Saul would still be king. But God would still have his way. And remember that we said the last time that 
that sin does not diminish with time as far as God's concerned. We can't think that because we did a sin ten years ago and didn't repent of it that somehow it will diminish and it will just fade away. If we're deliberately walking in sin then we can end up the same way as Saul did. So keep your short account to God. Make sure that the sin that you have in your life is, is, is repented of quickly. So then, although God says to him, you know, how long will you mourn for Saul? He says, fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. So there's, there's a lightness here. That, you know, maybe Samuel had thought that, you know, after all the troubles that we had with Saul and the problems with the Amalekites, etc., that maybe God wouldn't use him again. And here God says to him, Come on, Samuel, you're still my man. Fill your horn with oil. And what a statement that is, isn't it? I mean, it's just, it would be one of these ram's horns with a sort of a hole in one end and a stopper in the other and filled with oil and ready to anoint somebody with that oil. And you know, I often wonder, you know, are we really filling our horn with oil? Are we ready to do the work of God? Are we ready with that anointing of the Holy Spirit to bring to people? Do we carry that horn of oil around with us? Or are we needing a horn filled with oil? You know, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a responsibility here for Samuel and for all of us. God didn't say, I'm going to fill your horn with oil and then you're going to do my bidding. He said, go and fill your horn with oil. Lord, fill me anew. Fill me again with the power of your Holy Spirit. Let us be a, a people that are constantly seeking after the Spirit of the Lord. It's the only way we can go. So, that in some measure, a bit of excitement for Samuel here. I'm sending you to Jesse. I've chosen one of his sons to be king. And then the next statement tells us exactly what sort of attitude or motive that Saul had in his heart. But Samuel said at verse 2, How can I go? Saul will hear about it and kill me. And it wasn't just a case that when we say to somebody, you know, see, do that again, I'll kill you. You know, it wasn't a sort of analogy. This was... You know, Saul will take a sword against me. He will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Verse 3, Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint me. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. So here's Jesse of Bethlehem. And if you remember from Colin's study, or maybe he's not got to that bit yet, but Jesse was the grandson of Ruth and Boaz who were in that book of Ruth that great romantic book that great book that speaks of the Messiah coming so here was this this Jesse and this would be the start of the what would you say the, the physical line the royal line of Jesus where he would be from the house of Jesse a root out of dry ground and so Samuel says to the Lord oh, wait a minute you'll kill me And you know, when we read that, the Lord said, take a heifer and sacrifice to the Lord. And many people say to me, but surely, is that God telling lies? Is he he deceiving people here? And he's not. He's just saying to Samuel, just don't tell them that you're coming to anoint somebody king. Just take a heifer. You're going to make a sacrifice to the Lord. It's, It's quite an order. There's nothing wrong with doing what you're doing. And there's nothing wrong with what I'm telling you to do. All I'm doing is making sure that Saul doesn't take a sword to you. But I often think about that from the point of view of where we, where we do deceive each other at times. And I'm often convinced that although we should never tell lies, we never ever should. But is it a lie when it does good? Or is it not a lie when it doesn't do good? I think my lies are intended to be malicious. They're not intended to, to do good. You know, we could, I think I've said this before, you know, it's like, it's like the bride on her wedding day and she's a kind of comely looking lassie, you know, and she's no very, no, the most beautiful in the world and she's maybe not got the right figure and all the rest of it, but there she is. It's her wedding day, she's got the dress on and everything and, and you walk up to her and you say, oh, you're looking great, hen. But you could say, you're no very good looking, are you? You know, I mean, one would be the truth and the other would maybe be the lie, but but 
what do you say? I mean, would it accomplish anything to tell her, well, you're not really all that smart looking then, so... So, I mean, it's a matter of conscience there. I mean, what is a lie? It's, it's a very, very emotive issue. What is a lie? And when is it a lie? A lie to me is something that is intended for malice. It's intended to really mislead and put people in a wrong place. Anyway, you can take out of that what you want. Invite Jesse to a sacrifice. I will show you the one that I want to anoint. So at verse 4, Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they saw him and they asked, Are you come in peace? Now, I would suggest that this is fairly shortly after the judgment on the Amalekites. And I've heard that Samuel has literally hacked this king Agag into pieces. And they're wondering, is this the judgment of God coming again upon us? Are we, you know, it's like being followed by a police car. You just feel guilty right away, don't you? You don't. I mean, the first thing you do is you look at your speedometer and you think, 32 million, I hope he's not going to stop me. Um, but you, and that's, there must have been a, a, a turmoil in, in Bethlehem because, you know, coming up the road they would have their lookouts out because sometimes there were bandits and stuff around them. Say, well, go and tell the elders, Samuel's coming up the road and he's got a sword with him. So here we are, do you come in peace? And they tremble before him. And Samuel replied, yes, I come in peace. I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. Now this would be a a normal sacrifice. It may well have been. It would normally be initiated by the family. It would normally have been initiated by Jesse. That he would ask the priest to come and offer a sacrifice. Because they would want to do it as either a fellowship offering as a peace offering. If it was a sin offering, then what was sacrificed was totally consumed in fire. There was nothing of it eaten. With a fellowship offering or a peace offering, then half of it would be consumed by the fire unto the Lord and the other half would be eaten as a feast, a formal feast. And this is what was happening here. They were setting it up to be a formal feast. And it's, I mean, it's not something that would happen in five minutes here. It may have been over the course of a couple of days where they would have to sacrifice the beasts, they would have to build an altar, they would have to burn the the half of the altar and then sort of barbecue the other half. So it wasn't something that just happened on a morning. So Samuel would probably have been there for maybe a day or two. So he, he, he consecrates the elders. Now this consecration would, it would be the sort of Jewish rite of cleanliness and hygiene and all the rest of it before you partake in a feast. It might have been a washing ceremony or, I don't know, they might have got their hair cut or whatever. Whatever it was, that was what it was. It was setting apart, consecration, a setting apart, a setting apart to the Lord. They couldn't come in their everyday clothes to, to set apart to the Lord. They had to come out of their working clothes so that no evidence of work being done was before the Lord. And of course... That speaks of God's grace. God's grace is, is done without any work being done on our behalf. So picture the scene here. We've got Jesse with his seven sons at the moment. And we've got the elders of Israel. And they're all gathered and they're, they're ready to have this feast. And when they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab, that was the oldest son, and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things man look at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And oh, oh, so true it is. All we can look at from each other's point of view is what's happening on the outside. Until such times as we do something or say something that gives us reason to differ from it. But remember, it's here we have a situation where it's Samuel thought... This was Samuel's idea. Here comes Eliab, what a big guy he is. But he hadn't learned the lesson. He hadn't learned the lesson of Saul. Saul was chosen, remember, because he was a big strapping guy. It would appear that he was light-skinned, which was something that was relatively unusual. Most of the the Jews and and people in that era at that time were relatively dark-skinned people. But this guy was light-skinned with light hair, and he was a big guy. 
And they thought, oh, you know, if you need a king, this is the king you need. But God puts him in his place and he says, don't look at the way he, he stands. or he, he says, I know his heart and it's not his heart I'm looking for. So pass him by. And then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Now, notice as we go through this, that there's never any mention of the Lord choosing him to be a king. Because this was going to be done in secret. There would be something here that Samuel would say to Jesse, that the Lord has chosen one of your sons for a task that I will tell him about. It was not Jesse's business. It was a business between Samuel the Lord and whoever was chosen. It was not something that was to be made public. And, and the people in those days would recognise that, that the priest had a calling where he could speak to people quietly and individually and, and interpret for the Lord into their lives. So it was never mentioned by Samuel here. And possibly Jesse thought this is a bit of an inconvenience. You know, I've got work to go on with you and here you are. You're up here telling me that you want to anoint my son for some task, but and we're going to make a sacrifice, and we're going to build the altar, and it cost me a couple of cows, and all that. I mean, it may well have been that Jesse was a bit kind of put down about the whole thing. So Anidabab, oh, Abinadab, it's like an anagram, isn't it? <laughs> and in verse 9, Jesse then made Shammah pass by, but Samuel said, Nor has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, As the, Are these all the sons that you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered, But he is tending the sheep. What does that tell you? What do you think of that when you read that? Here was a family with seven sons, And they were all consecrated to the Lord. They were all in their best kit. They were at a sacrifice. They were a fellowship offering, a peace offering. They were invited to the barbecue and here, one of the sons is out tending the sheep. Now that was a servant's job. That wasn't a, 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 the son of the family. That wasn't he. So they didn't think much of him. He wasn't invited to the feast. He was considered of no account because they thought, well, there's no point in bringing David. Nobody's going to pick David to do anything. So in their own understanding, they thought, well, we'll leave David to watch the sheep. And possibly David was out there watching the sheep because that was what he enjoyed. Maybe he enjoyed the sheep better than he did his brother's company. <laughs> because they were always putting him down. They were always considering him to be bought with a pile. And so, they're still the youngest. And notice that Jesse doesn't even call him by name here. He says, I've still got a youngest son. But he's out tending the sheep. And Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So Samuel held up the feast. This was to be a point where the son would be anointed, whichever one was chosen, and then they would all sit down and have this barbecue and whatever uh, unto the Lord. But Samuel said, well, until I see this eighth son of yours, we're doing nothing. I don't care if the meat's burned or whatever, it's just, we're not, we're not doing it. So he sent and had him brought in. He was ruddy with fine appearance and handsome features. Still no mention of his name. This was another guy, like Saul, who appeared to have been, because of the working here, it would be, he'd appear to have been slightly lighter skinned than most of the Middle Eastern people. You know how some of them have got a lot of sallow complexions. Well, that David seemed to have been ruddy. He seemed to have been more sort of white, if you want to call it that, than, than the people around him. But he was handsome features, he had a fine appearance. And he, and in comparison to Saul, Saul was a real good looking guy. He was the, he was the Hollywood king. You know, he was the Charlton Heston. He was the guy that looked like a king. David here was a handsome enough guy, but you wouldn't have put him in the, the you know, you wouldn't have made him Moses in the, you know, the Ten Commandments or anything. He was, he was a kind of good looking guy, but nothing startling. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him, he is the one. And this is where it would get a bit secretive. Saul would take him apart, although everybody that was there would see what was happening, Saul would take him apart, Samuel would take him apart, sorry. 
So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on the spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. And Samuel went to Ramah. So there's no great fuss about this. You know, if Samuel had allowed it to slip that this was the new king of Israel, there would have been a, a, an uproar going on. But this is something that, that Samuel had taken David apart and had anointed him with oil. And he said, you know, son, God's going to make you king over Israel. And this is what this anointing means. And I don't know what David's reaction to it must have been. He thought, hey, me? My brothers don't like me. My father doesn't think much of me. And yet I'm going to be king over Israel. And you know, I want to encourage you with that this morning. You know, God can use the lowest of the low. It doesn't matter what you think of yourself. It's what God thinks of you. This was a boy who, was, who would grow up to be a man after God's own heart. And yet, he was written off by his family in some measure. Oh, you're David, he'll never come to anything. And all these big brothers that he had, who were all big strapping lads, who were all part of the family, and yet, here was lowly David, the one who tended the sheep. And of course, we can say that as we go on in the book of Samuel here, that God would use that ability to shepherd sheep to look after Israel. So don't ever think, don't think too low of yourself. Don't think, oh, what would God ever do with me? God can do all things. He can do all things. Why? Because he'll anoint you with his spirit. That horn of oil that was poured over David, a sign of the spirit, a sign of the, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. He can use you. He will use you. All you have to do is be available. David could have said when they sent for him, you know, come up because your father wants you to attend this feast. Well, if I can't get an invitation the first time around, I'm not coming the second time. And he would have lost his opportunity. But David kept the humble heart. Even although his father and his brothers didn't really think an awful lot of him, he was still obedient to them. He still wanted to be that obedient son, trying his best. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and that's the same word we spoke in the earlier chapters of the first Samuel that we would see a lot of the move of the Holy Spirit in people's lives. The Spirit of the Lord that never takes a rest. He never sort of stands by and says, Well, hold on guys, I'm tired, I've had enough. Whenever you're ready, he's ready. So don't think too lowly of yourself. And it's only here when we see the actual the Spirit of the Lord mentioned that we hear the name of David mentioned. The Spirit of the Lord just didn't come upon the guy that was looking after the sheep. It came upon David. And the word David means beloved of God. It would be 25 years until he actually took up the post of king. But his training would start very quickly. And it would start in the most unexpected way you would think. And so we'll have a wee look at that quickly as we go along here. So the Spirit of the Lord had come upon, and that, that same word, that's, if we translate that up through the Greek into the English, that's the same word, dynamis, dynamite, the, the power of the Lord. That's what came upon him. There was no indwelling Holy Spirit at that time, but the Spirit of the Lord came upon people to allow them to perform things or to see things in a supernatural fashion. You look at Gideon and you look at Samson and you look at Samuel and all of these people. The Spirit of the Lord at some point in time and, and frequently came upon them and they could move in the power of the Lord and so we see the converse at the start of verse 14 here now the spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him now that, that would give you the impression that God is vindictive and that's not the truth the spirit of the Lord had departed that anointing that coming upon had departed from Saul because of his own desire he didn't want to be obedient to God. He's shown that many times. And God will not contend with man forever. One day it will be all over. And whether you've accepted or rejected, on that basis, you will be judged. So the Spirit of the Lord departed, and this Spirit came upon him and tormented him. Now, to put that scripture in its proper context, an evil spirit allowed from the Lord tormented him. That's what the word actually means. 
God allowed an evil spirit to torment him. The protection of the Lord was no longer upon Saul for his kingdom. And Saul was being tormented by an evil spirit. Saul's attendants said to him, See, an evil spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord command his servants here to search for someone who can play the harp. He will play when the evil spirit from God comes upon you and you will feel better. I don't know where they got this idea from. I don't know whether somebody had been playing music to Saul and it had kind of calmed him down a bit. Or whether it was a custom when people were mentally disturbed that they would play music to them and it it would calm them down. But we find here that the servant said, look, let's let's try this. Let's see if we can find somebody. And really what they were looking for in some measure was a worship leader. They were looking for somebody who moved in the things of God and who was technically able to play the harp. There's no point in running in with a harp and saying, I can play it and then it's just nonsense that comes out of it. So they were looking for somebody who would be able to play the harp. Incidentally, just as I mentioned it there, this is the first mention of David in the Bible. And he would be mentioned 971 times from here on. He's the most mentioned person in the Bible apart from Jesus. That respect of Moses and Abraham and all these other guys, David is the most mentioned and most, his name is lifted more times, 971 times. Jesus, I think, I think I'd written it down here, 1,281 references to Jesus. 971 for David. So what an impact he had on the history of Israel and on the coming of the Messiah. Anyway, so Saul said to his attendants, find someone at verse 17 who plays well and bring him to me. One of the servants answered, I have seen a son of Jesse of Bethlehem who knows how to play the harp. He is a brave man and a warrior. He speaks well and is a fine looking man and the Lord is with him. So, apart from the fine looking guy, maybe that's what we need in a worship leader. Is that right, Robin? (laughs) We need somebody. (laughs) We need, if you're going to lead worship, you need to be technically able to do it. You need to be and 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 doubt of the Lord, if you want to call it that. It's not just something. We're, we're not just playing guitars and singing songs in here on a Sunday morning. We're worshiping the Lord, and that's something that is separate and special. And he says, "We need someone here who plays well. Bring him to me." So this guy says, "There's a son of Jesse in Bethlehem. He's a brave man, a warrior. He speaks well. He's a fine-looking man, and the Lord is with him. He, you know, he plays well. The Lord is with him. He's fine. Look, this is a this could be a guy you're looking for." Isn't it wonderful how God works these things? Here was the king of Israel about to employ a guy who was already anointed king of Israel and didn't know it. Then Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, Send me your son David, second mention him in the Bible, who is with the sheep. Does that not tell you the heart of David? Even although Samuel had told him, You're going to be king over Israel, son. Okay, Samuel, whenever you think. He went back to tending the sheep. That was what he enjoyed doing. And we can see that by all the Psalms that he wrote. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He'll make me lie down with green pastures. Just the things that he would have done with his sheep. Here though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And he did frequently. It's no wonder that they called this young man brave. Because he'd fought lions and he'd fought bears to protect his flock. He was a brave young man. Out there in the dark, can you imagine it? You've got a flock of sheep lying in front of you and it's pitch black. You might have a fire lit just to keep you warm or just to give you a bit of light and you hear the roar, 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 the lion in the background or the bear. And rather than just sit there and think, well, I hope he goes away, you go out and find him and you kill him in the dark. You don't know what size it is. You don't know how many of them there are and yet you have that, what would we say, anointing of the Lord that would take you to that place and we'll see that in the next chapter how brave David was so they said send me your son David who is with the sheep so Jesse took a a donkey loaded with bread a skin of wine a young goat and sent them with his son David to Saul 
You know, here we're again at the bread and the wine, but that's another study altogether and a sacrifice. A tribute to the king. David came to Saul and entered his service, and Saul liked him very much, and David became one of his armour bearers. And the other, the, the words there, in the New King James, I think it says that Saul loved him. And that really is, he loved him as a son. What an irony, what a paradox we've got here. This is the guy whom within a few years he would be chasing down within an inch of his life. And yet he had such an affection for this young man at this point in time. Maybe this was Saul's last opportunity to repent. Maybe this coming of David, this man of God in his life was the opportunity for Saul to say, you know, there is... There is a bit of softness in me. There, there is a, a lightness in my spirit. When I talk to this young man and I hear him singing and it, he quietens my heart, m- maybe this is my way back. But Saul was not prepared to take that. He was not prepared to take that route. And it's something we have to bear in mind. You know, there are things that we can really harden our heart against. And it becomes we become so hard-hearted in it that we don't even notice that we're hard-hearted. Until somebody comes along and starts to speak into the situation. And you think, you know, I've been really quite wrong in that situation. I need to sort that out. Or, you say, oh, don't talk to me about it. I don't want to hear it. And we've had plenty of people say that to us. So Saul liked him very much and he became one of his armour bearers. Armour bearers were very important to, if you want to call them soldiers or, or Officers, for want of a better word. The armour bearer, the soldier would fight at the front with sword and shield and the armour bearer would cover his back. He literally fought at the back of him. And that was what they did. They stopped anybody from backstabbing the soldier or the king. So it was a very responsible job, especially for a king. And yet David had shown himself to be of that sort of nature that Saul immediately took to him and said, I can trust this guy. I can trust him to such a point that I can trust him with my life. And of course, when we see David, we see a picture of Jesus. Such is the the, the strength of the Lord in our lives that we can trust him with our lives. That we should never doubt that he is always for our best. And such was Saul's love for David that he said, Allow David to remain in my service for I am pleased with him. And at verse 23, whenever the Spirit from God came upon Saul, David would take his harp and play. Then relief would come to Saul. He would feel better and the evil spirit would leave him. The power of music. Music can move us in ways that that words can never move us. And the devil knows it. Because the devil was the praise leader in heaven. He knows the power of music. He knows that he can use music to take people away from the Lord and he knows that the Lord can use music to draw people to him. Who was it that wrote the book? Why does the devil have all the good music? You know, Larry Norman. Larry Norman, that's right, Larry Norman. And, and it's true. You know, the, the young people of today are pulled away by the music, and it's not even the music, that, it's the lyrics that go with it. You know, the whole combination of the thing just pulls people away from the Lord. And I thank God for people like Brenton Brown and all these other guys that write wonderful stuff to praise the Lord. We, we, we are modern tune in it that, that we can that really draws us, that moves our hearts. So whenever the spirit of the Lord, that bad spirit came from God upon Saul, David would pick up his heart and play. And how many times do we see that as well? When we're feeling down and we're feeling low, we put on a CD and somebody starts to sing and it just lifts us. And it just you know, many of the sort of People that are struggling with anxiety, they are given relaxation tapes and often it's, it's very quiet music or, or it's maybe the, the rhythm of a sea, you know, the waves lapping on the seashore, etc. But the quietness just brings about that healing. And it's something I would commend to you. That, you know, even if you, you know, often sit up the stairs when I'm studying and I just kind of quietly sing to myself, you know. If anybody was there, I think it's off my head, but... Um, but you know, when we, what we take out of this is that we have to be a people who are open to the things of the Lord. We need to be a David and not a Saul. We need to be somebody who's soft enough to allow God to use us, to anoint us with his spirit. 
and not to be hard-hearted like Saul, who was only out for his own gain. And today, unfortunately, there are many within the church who want to be elevated to the status of rock stars because they've got big churches. Their heads have been turned and many of them, unfortunately, have fallen into sin. We don't want to be like that, even as a Christian, let alone as a leader. So, my prayer for you today is that God wants to use you. God wants to anoint you with that oil of salvation, that oil of of His Holy Spirit in your life. And you can be used. You don't have to be a leader in the church or to be somebody special. You just need to be available to God with that right heart open and ready to be used. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your word today, Lord. I just pray that you would anoint your people in here, Lord. There's none of us any better one than the other, Lord. We're gifted in different ways, Lord. But we're all gifted by you. And therefore the gifts are just as important one as the other. So Father, bless us as a fellowship this morning, Lord. Help us to know a bit more about your nature and who you are as we study through this book. Lord, be a blessing to us today, Lord. Lift that blanket of heaviness that some may have, Lord. And help us to have that garment of praise. So be with us, Lord, and keep us this day as you always do. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.